finishing up our last week of Jesus on the earth, uh, the things that he went through. I tried not to uh, uh, go over all the normal things that you normally saw that week, but there was um, one thing I wanted to I wanted to finish it up on this one note. It's in John 18, if you have your Bibles in John 18. <clears throat> it's uh, when Jesus had been taken from the Garden of Gethsemane by the soldiers. The first place he was taken was to the former high priest whose name was Annas. Uh, Caiaphas was the current high priest, but the first person they took him to was to the house of Annas. And he was uh, very well known. He was uh, a stronghold in that community. He held much sway over the people. So in John 18, we're going to begin in verse number 19. <clears throat> God's word says, The high priest, that is actually Annas, the former high priest, then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Now, it was always a point of contention. And he's really not asking anything other than just trying to find something where he can justify what he wanted to do, which was to crucify Jesus. Jesus answered him in verse 20. I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret I have done nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. He's saying, I've already, I, I, I haven't hid anything. I was very public in my, in, in my teaching. Uh, probably as he's looking around the room, he looks in and said, I, I know most of you. I saw a lot of you. Uh, you heard me preach. You know everything that I had to say. Verse 22, and when he had said the, those things, one of the officers, one of the officers who stood by Jesus struck him with the palm of his hand, just a good old-fashioned open slap. It was meant to be demeaning. It was meant to, uh, to poke a hole in him a little bit. How dare you? It was meant to uh, just make him seem small. He said, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, then why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, knowing that there really was nothing that he could say about it. Now here's the phrase I want you to, to catch if we can find something in this. He says, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. You bear witness. You say what it was. I'm not going to say anything. You say it. Now, Jesus would leave and go to Caiaphas and the rest of the Pharisees and the, uh, the high priest, and all those that were there the, that, that would be caught up in the, at that time in the night. They were there with Caiaphas to have this court in the middle of the night, which you're not supposed to do. And when they brought all these accusations against Jesus, Jesus never said a word. How hard it must have been, how hard it is for us, if somebody is making false accusations about us, if somebody's talking about us, to not bear witness of ourself. It would be very easy, matter of fact, it's expected, listen now, that we defend ourselves, But we're not supposed to. If somebody asks me a question, I'll give them an answer. But I'm not supposed to, if, if people are just throwing accusation, I'm not supposed to be the one to come and bear witness to that. Now, I want you to stay with me. If you, in John chapter 5, Jesus spoke about this. And, and he was being asked them um, about who he was and, and all of that. He, he said in John 5, verse 19, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, 
For whatever he, that is the Father, does, the Son also does in like manner. And in verse 30 of that same chapter, John 5, he said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. Now listen to this phrase. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. I'm not here to defend myself. I'm not. It always comes off a little different or sour when you're defending yourself. When you're trying to justify yourself. Jesus says in the next verse, verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And he's speaking, obviously, of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to prop myself up. I don't need to point fingers at myself. I just live the life that I'm supposed to. I do what my Father tells me to do. What He says, that I do. And I'm not really worried about the results. The results will take care of themselves. What I'm supposed to do is to be honest, true, and faithful. I serve Him. I live for Him. I have given my life to Him. All my life is for Him. That's really what we are to do as Christians. We are to do what the Father would have us to do. As Christians, we're to bear witness of Him. We're not to bear witness of ourselves. We're not to prop up ourselves. We're not to defend ourselves. We're simply supposed to state the truth of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I don't have to worry about what I do. I leave myself in the faithful hands of God and let Him take care of it. If He wants to bear witness of me, He will send His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness in our heart. He also goes on to say that everyone that is called of God, that the Holy Spirit will woo them, draw them to Himself. Then I got to thinking about the cross after Jesus was silent. He was going to allow the world to do whatsoever they wanted to do to him. I'm going to use the word again. He would allow it. They beat him. You know that. They whipped him. They mocked him. They scourged him. They spat in his face. I can't hardly imagine that. While he was even up on the cross, people would come right up to his face. The, the cross would be dropped down into a hole. And what people don't really realize, they think the cross is being lifted high up. Really, his feet would have probably been 12 to 18 inches from the ground. And as he hung there hanging down, it was almost like he would, people could come up and get in his face. And they would spit in his face rail all kind of accusations against him. But it was Jesus' responsibility to that point, to that day, to be faithful to God, listen, and leave the results in God's faithful hands. So he took it. He carried the cross. He walked up that hill. Even when physically he could not carry it, he was there. Walked the rest of the way up. And when they laid the cross on the ground, they didn't have to throw him down. He was simply placed there. I'm sure he just opened his hands up. He didn't yell at them. He didn't scream at them. He didn't mock them. Oftentimes we do. Have you ever been in a store where maybe the clerk didn't do the right thing and you brought it to their attention and they just defended themselves and you're trying to say that's not the right way? And if you're not, if you're not careful, you can lose your Christianity in 10 seconds, can't you? 
And you, you just think, I'm just trying to do the right thing. But really, you just keep your mouth shut and smile. You don't act ugly. I think the Lord looked at the people who were driving the nails in his hands. And I don't think he looked at them with anger, do you? He was willing. Why did they put the nails in his hands? Obviously to keep him there. But his love kept him there. He could have come down. He didn't have to stay there. He could have called 10,000 angels. It could have been over in just a few seconds. His love kept him there. When they picked him up and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't realize. They don't understand the, what they're doing. So don't hold it to their account. His love was there. When he did speak, he spoke in love. His clothes that were taken from him. He was crucified naked on the cross. They gambled for his clothes there. His outer garment did not have a, a seam in it. They saw value in that. Get this, they saw more value in that than the man, the life hanging on the cross. The sign that was over him that said, King of the Jews. Pilate didn't realize it but he was speaking truth. He was really prophesying because one day Jesus will return as the king of all his people. He did it in love. He was quiet when they scoffed at him. When he did speak, he spoke in love. He saw his mom there. Evidently, Joseph, his stepdad, was gone. So he looked at John, the writer of the Gospel of John, and said, Woman, behold your son. Man, behold your mother. And from that day on, Mary found her home in the house of John. He wanted to take care of his mom. He spoke in love. When the thief who had just a little bit earlier had been cursing him. Felt differently in his heart and looked over at him. With the pulling of the Holy Spirit, he testified and he said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Once again, Jesus looked over in love and said, today you will be with me. And the best word that they had to describe heaven, paradise, words of love. Oh, there's much that Jesus could have said that day, but he never cared to say those things that day. All he chose to do is speak in love. All he chose to do was to love us with an everlasting love. I could hear the kids up there as they were singing and dancing. And I could hear the verses that they were quoting. And I thought of how many of, how many of y'all, the very first verse that you ever memorized was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The witness of the Holy Spirit is at work. I got the privilege this week to talk to the kids about salvation. I haven't got to follow up with all of them yet. Um, I couldn't come to Vacation Bible School Thursday. I had something else I had to do on Friday. Um, as far as I know, there were seven kids that came to know Jesus Christ this week. <clears throat> Some of the ones that I was expecting to come to know the Christ didn't. Some of the ones that I was not expecting at all did. Isn't it good that God knows exactly what He's doing? It's not left up to me. One of the things that the kids wanted to know was, when should I? When should I? And I looked over at 
one of them that was asking a question. By the way, um, one of our church kids, she's sweet as sweet can be. She's innocent, she's naive, and she's been under conviction for a while. And she had heard but not, didn't know all that there was to know about the age of accountability. There's a point in time in your life that you are uh, uh, of a place where uh, you're not, God's not going to hold you accountable for what you don't know or understand. You're, you're under His grace. But when you come to that point in time in your life that you knowingly, willingly choose to do wrong, then you're responsible. So um, I just said, do you know the difference between right and wrong? Yeah. So you know when you do right, yeah. You know when you do wrong, yeah. And you choose to do wrong anyway. Yeah. If you got caught, who would be responsible? Now, in a childlike manner, all of us are supposed to come to the Lord like children. We're all supposed to just simply love, obey, believe, trust in the Lord, repent. And that's an attitude. I've been repenting every day since I got saved. But that's because I keep messing up. And I want to keep that straight between me and the Lord. But it's simply repent of what you know that you're supposed to be repented of. I want to not do it my way. I want to do it His way. And God works. Adults, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. but you will be held responsible. You don't get a pass. Everybody's got to make up their mind. Jesus did not bear witness of Himself, but He was expecting the Holy Spirit to do that. And if the Holy Spirit comes and begins to work with you in your heart and life, listen. Jesus said it from the cross, it is finished his work is done. Salvation, the way of salvation has been made. It's, it's complete. Except you must now receive it. It's harder for adults than it is for kids. Because kids have an ability to trust and obey. For adults, we're afraid about what somebody else is going to think and all that kind of stuff. Can I just say that stuff doesn't matter? If you get right with God and you do what God wants you to do, everyone else will rejoice in that. If they're your friend, they will rejoice in that. There's a lot of things that need to be done in our life, and God's just waiting to see if you're willing to do them.